Welcome and thank you all for joining the second Department of Epidemiology annual COVID-19 seminar. My name is Till Sturmer and I'm the chair of the Department of Epidemiology. I will be brief since you want to hear from our experts. Let me just say that you will see a lot of numbers since epidemiologists need these to understand diseases. We do realize, however, that behind each of these numbers are family members and friends that have suffered or died and whose loss we mourn. Let me now hand it over to Karen Yates, Associate Professor of Epidemiology and the lead of the Applied Epidemiology MPH concentration. Thank you, Jill. Uh, so delighted to have you all here with us today. Uh, just a really quick uh, background. So a year and 19 days ago, over 200 students, faculty, and staff gathered in the School of Social Work Auditorium here on the UNC Chapel Hill campus to learn about the epidemiology and biology of the SARS-CoV-2 virus from Drs. Barrick, Power, Weber, and Fleischauer. Um, they join us here again today to present their most recent research and existing research, and as well as we have an additional guest, Dr. Audrey Pettifor. I also wanna acknowledge other colleagues who um, are um, in our department, um, Dr. Allison Aiello and Whitney Robinson, Daniel Westreich, who are also doing important COVID research, but unfortunately uh, we can't fit everyone in uh, for this particular time. We hope to have them at another time. Also, um, next slide, if you could, um, a share, um, chair. Um, so we, I'd like to acknowledge the partnership and excellence for applied epidemiology with the communicable disease branch uh, for the North Carolina Division of Public Health. Um, next slide. Um, and here we have our agenda for today. Um, so we'll have um, two Q&A sessions moderated by Dr. Andy Olshin, who is the Barbara Hulka uh, Professor of Cancer Epidemiology and who organized the first COVID seminar. Um, we're so delighted to have Dr. Uh, Barrick here with us today. He is the William Keenan Professor of Epidemiology in the department here, um, and he has over 35 years of research on coronaviruses with uh, uh, over 445 publications as of last night um, in really, um, well, uh, internationally recognized uh, uh, journals. Um, we also have Dr. Kim Powers, who's an infectious disease epidemiologist, who actually is a real modeler and, and provided really useful expertise um, to the state leadership, both the governor and the state legislature in the early phases of the pandemic. She also recently won the Teaching Innovation Award as she was teaching through the pandemic last spring um, and talking about COVID um, every week in her class. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Barrick. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction, Karen. Um, and it's uh, a pleasure to give you an update on uh, SARS coronavirus 2 evolution and countermeasure performance. And so uh, I just thought I'd start off with uh, where we are in the existing pandemic, uh, about 14 months into it now. There have been about 2.71 million deaths globally and about 542,000 deaths in the United States. The good news is that uh, mortality rates have, uh, have been, number of, of, of lethal cases have been dropping uh, steadily in the United States. We had 444 yesterday which is quite a difference from uh, uh, December, January, the year where we had close to 5,000. I think best case scenario would probably be that we would have somewhere uh, just below 50,000 more deaths before we see the back end of this pandemic. Uh, this talk will focus on the spike like a protein of uh, SARS-2, which is this big brown peplomer right here. This is what the structure of it actually looks like. And there's two important domains, the receptor binding domain and the NTD or the N-terminal domain of this protein that are critical for neutralizing uh, and vaccine, neutralizing antibodies and vaccine uh, performance. And the RBD domain uh, binds to the ACE2 receptor to mediate docking and entry of cells. So I'm gonna talk about variants, vaccines and therapeutics with um, um, their, uh, their performance in terms of variants and other strains that exist in the future. 
Uh, so our first recognition of variants and their importance in understanding the expanding pandemic uh, occurred around February of 2020 when a new variant called the D614G variant shown here and aspartic acid in the spike glycoprotein of position 614 is what came out of Wuhan, China back in December, January of 2020. Uh, this G variant emerged in Southern Europe in late February and became the dominant strain globally. Uh, it was associated with upper respiratory tract titers uh, in patients, but not with increased disease severity. So to give you an example of some of the experiments that are done to study how these variants uh, cause disease and or their biological features that may be important for um, the, the remainder of the pandemic. Uh, we made molecular clones of these, of these viruses, encoding either the D variant or the G variant at position uh, 6114, and then compared their replication in a variety of primary cell types, starting from the nose down to the lower lung. And when you do these types of studies, you find that the, and these each dot here represents a different patient code of uh, nasal airway epithelial cells or large bronchial airway epithelial cells infected either with a wild type or the D614G variant. Uh, you notice that this G4, uh, uh, G variant grows to much higher titer at 24, 48, and 72 hours, especially in the nose as compared to the ancestral strain. It also grows to higher titer in the large airway epithelial cells as compared to the ancestral strain. So this virus tr truly was able to grow more efficiently in the upper respiratory tract. What are the biological implications of that event? Well, one thing you can do is you can do what are called competition or fitness experiments, in essence, in essence doing transmission studies in cultures of primary airway cells derived from uh, human donors. And so you can infect these cultures with both viruses, the wild type and the G variant, at equal uh, multiplicity of infection and every three days take the progeny out and infect a new culture like it was a transmission event. And when you do those studies, you can use a marker, a mutation marker in both viruses to track who wins. So the wild type virus, for example, the uh, DNA, the RNA of the virus has a restriction site. It cleaves it into the two pieces, the G variant doesn't. By passage zero, uh, initially, they have about equal amounts of virus, but with each passage, the G variant dominates and the D variant goes extinct. This occurs either at a one-to-one -one or at a 10 to one ratio. So even with an excess amount of the ancestral strain, this new G variant can now compete uh, in the upper respiratory tract, explaining its uh, a dominance globally over a four month period of time. Another assay that's typically done is called a neutralization assay. And that's evaluating the ability of serum from humans to neutralize uh, either the ancestral strain or the G variant that came uh, out of uh, Southern Europe. And this is a called, uh, this is a measurement of the amount of sera, the dilution of your sera that's capable of neutralizing half of the viruses, the, whether they encode a D at position 614 or G at 614. And you can see that the G variant is actually more susceptible to neutralization as compared to the ancestral strain. This is both at the ID50 and the ID80 levels. And it's about twofold more sensitive to neutralization. Uh, in collaboration with Yoshi Kaoka, we also did transmission studies looking at airborne transmission from a hamster uh, that's infected with virus, but the cage is separated by an air barrier that allows only for airborne transmission to a recipient hamster. And so if you infect uh, 16 donors, half with the D form up here, or half with the G form down here, you can see that all the hamsters, all the donor hamsters get infected. They all survive and they eventually clear virus. The recipients, however, that can only be infected by airborne transmission, the G variant of five out of eight are infected by day two compared to none with the original D variant. Eventually the D variant infects everything, but this G variant is clearly more transmissible. And so in summary, uh, this G variant not only is more transmissible and more sensitive to neutralization, this is mediated by the receptor binding domain element that I talked about earlier. That spike is in the open position, upward position, so that it can grab the ACE2 receptor more efficiently. And that allows it to infect more efficiently, but it also makes it more sensitive to neutralization. Now this G variant is the uh, 
progenitor strain for all the new variants you've heard about, the UK variant, B117, the South African variant, B1351, the Brazilian variant, B1. All of these have this D614G mutation and additional mutations across the spike like a protein, including deletions or mutations in the NTD region, which encodes important neutralizing epitopes, mutations in the receptor binding domains like are shown here, which are critical for ACE2 binding and entry efficiency, and mutations elsewhere that affect the biology of the virus. In general, we're pretty sure all of these variants are more transmissible than the G variant. The UK strain, but probably the South African and the Brazil strain are also more virulent than the original G variant. And they have increased ability to escape neutralizing, especially the South African variant, which is about six to 10 times more resistant to neutralization than the original G strain that I just talked about. And this is just some data that David Martinez did in the lab, where he made, uh, working with Boyd Yant, made recombinant viruses that either encoded the South African spike or the D614G progenitor spike. And notice that this virus is significantly more resistant to neutralization compared to the ancestral G form of the variant, about six to eight fold reduced. Now, what does this mean? Uh, currently, the SARS coronavirus, in terms of variants for the future, the SARS coronavirus 2 population genetics is extremely large globally. And so we're in a scenario where new variants will emerge rapidly and continue to emerge. And early conditions were perfect for selecting for variants that were more transmissible, mostly because everybody was naive on the planet. The virus was spreading to people who had never seen the virus before. But as seroprevalence rates increase across the globe, we'll begin to select for strains that are more that have that are antigenically distinct and able to resist neutralization from the ancestral strains. And certainly that's the case of the UK, the um, <clears throat> South African, and the Brazilian isolates. In addition, um, these will also begin to be selected for for increased virulence so that they can infect individuals who have low level immunity who's most likely uh, uh, to be infected with these variants? Well, an important association is that after natural infection, very people who have very mild infections and don't require hospitalization typically have low neutralizing titers against the virus, the original virus. If you're hospitalized, the titers are a little bit higher. And if you're under severe infection, they're even higher. About 50 to 80% of the people are asymptomatics or people that have mild infection. So even an eight-fold reduction in uh, the titers of people who are asymptomatically or mildly infected who have a titer of around 200 could be dropped to a titer of about 25 and then they could be reinfected. It may not cause mortality, but they can be reinfected. And so this is the early stages of the variants of concern that we're seeing. Uh, there are other variants like New York or California that you've heard about. Uh, some of these variants knock out the performance of monoclonal antibody therapies that have been shown to be quite effective against the ancestral strains. But we can anticipate that these variants will become more antigenically distinct in the future. So what's the performance of the vaccines? Well, the Moderna vaccine, for example, gives a titer of about one to 5,000. So even if you knocked it down tenfold, it would still have a titer of about one to 500, which means that you are gonna be protected against infection with the vast majority of this initial round of variants. Even so, Moderna and Pfizer are reformulating to make the vaccines uh, more um, uh, compatible with the existing new variants. The Novavax vaccine is about 89% effective. It drops to about 59% effective in South Africa, 49% if you include HIV patients. AstraZeneca is about 67% effective. It gives much lower titers than Moderna or Pfizer antibody titers. Uh, and in South Africa, it's only 21.9% effective. And against the 351 variant that I talked about, it's about 10% effective. And people are getting um, mild to moderate infections, but again, fatalities seem to be very rare. We don't know very much about the killed vaccines or the Janssen vaccines. So keep in mind that when we talk about variants of concern here, they're about 1% different in the spike like a protein as compared to the ancestral strains that came out of Wuhan. And if you look across strains of other SARS coronaviruses that are high risk and that are fully programmed to replicate in human cells and potentially cause disease, they can range 
anywhere from a 35% different in the spike glycoprotein. So example, SARS-2 is 22% different than SARS-1 that emerged in 2003, and it's tw over 25% different from SHCL14. So what's the impact of strain variation on sars coronavirus 2 vaccine performance? And what sort of maximal level of variation might we able, be able to see these viruses achieve in the future? So David Martinez did an interesting experiment where he vaccinated mice with an mRNA vaccine that replicated the, Pfizer, the, the Moderna vaccine. And you have neutralization titers of about 1 to 10,000 against the SARS-2 recombinant nanolute virus. If you look at it, that Sarah's ability to neutralize the 2003 SARS coronavirus strain, there's a 40% reduction, 40-fold reduction in the neutralization titer. Against this bat strain, WIV1, it's a 50-fold reduction in the neutralization titer. And against SHCL14, which is the most dif distant variant, it's 500-fold. Compare that to the four to eight-fold where we are with the existing variants of concern. So we have a real issue in the future. <clears throat> Now, is there cross-protection between SARS vaccines and SARS-2 vaccines? This was required for Moderna to be initiate phase three trials. Um, Sarah Least in my lab worked with Kizzy Corbett to do these studies, where we vaccinated mice with Moderna 0.1 microgram or one microgram vaccine. They made great neutralizing titers, which are shown over here on this y-axis, or vaccinated mice with the SARS doubly inactivated vaccine that was made back in 2003. And it could still partially neutralize SARS-2. However, uh, non-vaccinated animals or SARS-1 vaccinated animals did not protect against SARS-2 lethal infection, while the Moderna vaccines did. Not only did they not protect against infection, it allowed for SARS-2 to replicate quite efficiently. So there's minimal cross-protection against these strains. Now, this is a complex slide, and I just want to hit the highlights. So how do we deal with these variants as they become more variant, different, or the strains that could emerge from animal populations in the future? And David Martinez has done this basically by uh, recognizing that the spike like a protein of the virus is modular in design. So the RBD, the NTD, and the ST2 domains all have neutralizing epitopes and they're interchangeable. So you can take the NTD of one strain and mix it with the RBD or the S2 region of different strains and build chimeric spikes, which are then put in RNA LMP, uh, Moderna-like uh, vaccine formulations, um, and then tested in mice. And the first thing we see is increased immune breadth against all of these different strains. And we can focus those boost responses on specific domains. And this is just some data to show that the SARS-2 vaccine, which does not protect against SARS coronavirus one challenge, can be protected against with these chimeric vaccine formulations. And not only in terms of protecting the animals from weight loss, they also prevent replication, not only against SARS-1, but also against SARS-2. So this is the first universal vaccine that's been developed that shows cross protection against all of the strains that I just talked about earlier. We can do the same thing with monoclonal antibodies. In this case, this is the RBD domain. And these are different monoclonals in different colors that bind to that receptor binding domain and neutralize the virus. Many of these antibodies are knocked out by the variants of concern, the mutations in the RBD that, aver that emerge uh, in human populations. But this one antibody, ABG2, shown here, that binds to the RBD interface is shown here in red. And basically, if the curve is further to the left, it means it's a much more potent neutralizing antibody. And so this ADG2 antibody is a better neutralizer of WIV1, SHCL14, two different high-risk bat coronaviruses, SARS-2 and SARS-1, as compared to anything on the market. So these are currently in phase two human trials. And so this antibody not also works against all the known variants. And so we are formulating new reagents to protect human populations. And in my final data slide, again, somewhat of a complex slide, I apologize for that. Uh, for direct acting antivirals to work for patients who are infected with these new variants that are more virulent, uh, it's important to remember that uh, you're infected for about four days before you develop clinical disease. That's when virus titers are the highest. 
And direct acting antivirals have to work within this region, this first seven day period to be maximally infective. But unfortunately, most of them don't get administered until you're hospitalized, shown here in the dark blue. So you gotta drive the, the drug to be uh, administered early, soon after diagnosis. And oral therapeutics are the most important. And I was really excited that Ridgeback Biosciences and Merck presented this data that uh, Tim Sheehan and Billy Fisher and I had worked on in phase two studies here at UNC, showing that molopinavir, if um, in patients who are diagnosed and then uh, given drug in an outpatient setting at home, uh, at three days after treatment, there's uh, reduced numbers of patients that are still virus positive, but by five days, they are, uh, the vast majority of patients have cleared infection. And so this is a whole new branch of therapeutics that will be effective not only against the ancestral strains, but the new variants of concern or future strains that might emerge. So with that, uh, you're gonna see continual emergence of these variants of concern. They're gonna become more and more distant over time. The mRNA vaccines in the US, I think are quite robust against the current crop of VOCs, but they may have more trouble, they have much more trouble against these zoonotic reservoir strains. But countermeasures and universal vaccine strategies are on the horizon so that we can take care of them. And so I would just sort of say that we're currently in the red queen uh, uh, state of uh, evolutionary theory where humans and uh, are working desperately to control the pathogen and the virus is desperately trying to figure out a way to maintain itself in human populations. Thanks for your attention. Sorry if I went over. Thank you, Ralph. Our next speaker is Dr. Ken Powers. Thank you, Karen, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today to share with you some of the work that we've been doing over this past year, modeling transmission of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the illness COVID-19, here in North Carolina. Next slide, please. So it was on the day of this very event last year, um, our first annual UNC Epidemiology COVID-19 uh, seminar, that we had our first diagnosed case of this novel coronavirus here in North Carolina. A few days after that first diagnosed case, our North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, starting with Dr. Aaron Fleischhauer, pictured down here at the bottom left, who will be speaking again at uh, this year's seminar shortly, uh, they reached out and asked if we could help to address some uh, really important, really urgent questions that our state public health leadership and our state emergency management leadership uh, were facing as this coronavirus was beginning to take root here in our state. Next slide, please. So just to give you a sense for the types of questions that they were grappling with and the types of questions that they asked for help with, these were questions like, how many people can we expect to become infected with this novel coronavirus in the coming days, weeks, months here in North Carolina? In a worst case scenario, how many ventilators are we going to need um, so that we can go ahead and, and start uh, ordering those? Are we likely to run out of hospital beds? And if so, when is that likely to happen? When will we see a peak in the cases in North Carolina and how many infections will we have at that point? What about schools that had just closed? Should we keep them closed? Should we reopen them? And if we reopen them, what kinds of downstream effects could we have on community transmission? Um, and then finally, how many contact tracers might we need as um, we have an expected flow of cases and the pandemic continues? So we got right to work um, with uh, some mathematical modeling. And before I go into the details and the specifics of our work, um, I'd like to just offer a very brief crash course in the mathematical modeling of infectious disease transmission dynamics um, with a description here of a so-called SIR model, where S stands for susceptible to infection, I stands for infected and infectious to others, and R stands for removed or recovered from infection, meaning no longer susceptible and no longer infectious. So we have these states or compartments that people can be in. And then we also need to specify the transitions that people can go through to go from one compartment to another. So in this very simple SIR example, those transitions are the process of acquiring infection, becoming infected, 
um, to go from the S to the I compartment, um, which we're specifying as occurring at rate lambda here. Um, and then the second transition that can occur is going from the infectious to the recovered compartment, um, becoming non-infectious, recovering from infection, um, as specified here with a gamma parameter. So with a, state, a, a set of um, states, compartments, and transitions that people can go through, um, we can describe this system with a set of equations, um, often differential equations, as I've shown here, um, where we uh, use these equations to describe the rate of change in the numbers of people in each compartment over time as a function of these rate parameters that uh, describe movement of, from one compartment to another. So we have these equations, and then in addition to the equations, we also need um, numerical values uh, to put into the model in terms of the numbers of people who are in each box to start with. At the beginning of a pandemic, you have pretty much everybody in the susceptible box and a handful of people in the infectious box. Um, and then also numerical estimates for the um, rate parameters, these Greek letters that describe movement from one compartment to another. So with these, um, uh, equations with these numerical values that describe movement from one compartment to another, we can simulate an epidemic to um, try to describe the numbers of people in each compartment over time and address the types of questions that um, we were all facing at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, next slide, please. So just to give you a basic sense of what this can look like, this figure shows model estimates using a model very similar to what I just showed you. Um, with of the number of infectious people uh, over time for a thousand different uh, scenarios, a thousand different simulations with different input parameter values. Um, so we can look at what might happen under a range of different scenarios. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so back to our questions. Uh, next slide again. Um, when we first set out, when we first started out, um, we were asked to focus on issues around hospital capacity. As um, we saw hospitals in Italy and places like New York City that were being overrun with cases. That was a big, big concern at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so we were asked to focus on that issue here in North Carolina. Next slide, please. So in order to do that, we developed a mathematical model that's very similar in the, in the basic idea to that SIR model that I showed a few slides back, but with some modifications to make it more specific to the specific pathogen that we were studying and the specific questions that we were asking. So more specifically, we included an asymptomatic and a presymptomatic compartment, the A and the P there, um, because that's important to the infection dynamics of this uh, novel coronavirus. We also included a J compartment for diagnosed cases, um, so we could estimate and project those and also calibrate our model to what was being observed on the ground. Hospitalized cases H, um, since a big focus of our early work was on hospitalizations, and deaths D, another important outcome to project and estimate and um, compare with, with what was happening on the ground. So. Um, Next slide, please. So as we were building this model in late March of last year, um, our governor, Governor Roy Cooper, had come out um, with a series of executive orders, um, including a statewide stay at home order uh, that went into effect on March 30th of last year, um, aiming to try to control the spread of the infection. Um, and so the state was interested in trying to understand what sort of impact um, changing those orders, continuing restrictions under varying scenarios, what kind of impact different, um, different strategies could have in terms of hospitalizations going forward. Um, so next slide, please. So just as one really quick example of one set of scenarios that we ran to answer some of these questions, this figure shows model estimates of numbers of people in the hospital in a couple of different scenarios, one without continued restrictions, and one with continued restrictions in, in, in a certain manner um, in blue there. And in, you can see this is sort of an example of the flattening the curve um, sort of approach that was uh, a, a catchphrase early on in the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So we joined forces um, early in the pandemic last year uh, with a number of other groups uh, in the area at other institutions that were also trying to tackle these sorts of questions. Um, and we, we put our heads together and did some composite modeling, combining insights across a range of different models. 
Um, we have we put out a policy brief in April of last year, the link um, of which is, is shown below for anyone who's interested in checking that out. But just to give you kind of the, the punchline, next slide, please. Um, we found in our modeling that not surprisingly, point number one here, maintaining restrictions would give us the best chance of not overrunning hospitals. Um, and on the flip side of that, lifting restrictions really quickly um, could give us a pretty high chance of, uh, of our capacity being outstripped by demand for hospital beds. Um, what happened from there was a, um, a gradual lifting of restrictions that um, fortunately, knock wood, uh, prevented us from running into those scary scenes of, of hospitals being overrun. Okay, so um, another type of question that we've addressed um, throughout this pandemic uh, are questions about how many cases there have been, how many cases we can expect it going forward under different scenarios and those, those types of questions. So just to give you a quick example of um, some analyses in this domain, um, this figure here shows model estimates of the cumulative, cumulative numbers of infections in North Carolina from the beginning of the pandemic. So um, early March of last year on the left up through uh, the beginning of March this year on the right. Um, and so I just wanna highlight here that these are model estimated numbers of cumulative infections, including both those that are not diagnosed and not seen and those that are diagnosed, which we know to be just the, the some portion of the metaphorical iceberg of all infections. Um, so, this is, so this is model estimates of both diagnosed and diagnosed cases. Um, and what we estimate here, uh, next slide please, is that by mid-October of last year, approximately 5% of the North Carolina population had been infected with this novel coronavirus um, compared to, uh, so that was reflects about twice as many cases as had been um, diagnosed at that point. Uh, next slide please. By the beginning of January of this year, we estimated that about 10% of the North Carolina population had been infected by the novel coronavirus. And then next slide, please. Um, up to the kind of one year mark as of March 1st, we estimated that about 12% of the population in North Carolina had been infected to date. Um, there are now some emerging uh, estimates coming out from seroprevalence studies that we um, will be Looking at uh, going forward, studies by Ross Boyce and Allison Ayello, Whitney Robinson here at UNC and others around the state to try to compare those estimates with what um, sorts of estimates are coming out on the ground in terms of seroprevalence studies. Um, and then finally, just very briefly, we are also using models to try to examine questions about school reopenings. Um, next slide, please. I think everyone here is probably very well aware that issues around school reopenings um, during this pandemic have been a matter of great controversy and great debate. So we um, kind of waded into this work, next slide please, last um, fall, Allison Aiello and I um, partnered with investigators at the Frank Porter Graham Institute to conduct a two-part study around school reopenings here in North Carolina, with the first part being um, a detailed review of district reopening plans and policies and practices in all 115 public school districts across the state. And then in the second part, we conducted an in-depth web survey with 700 teachers in four school districts that had opened to in-person learning in some capacity across the state um, to get uh, teachers, uh, you know, kind of eyes and ears on the ground perceptions of what was happening in schools. Um, the final report from that study is available on the North Carolina Policy Collaboratory website for anyone who's interested in checking that out. But just briefly, um, the way that we're using some of this information in modeling, um, next slide please, we are using information that we uh, gathered in terms of um, weekly status of school districts across the state in terms of their reopening. This is just a quick set of snapshots of um, reopening plans across the state over the first half of the year with the darker colors being more open to in-person learning. So you can see the progression there um, over the first half of the year. So we're using information on the mode that, that um, schools were in, Next slide, please, as well as information that we collected from our teacher survey on um, what mitigation measures were in place and teachers contact patterns in terms of where they were spending time. Um, indoors, outdoors, in school, out of school, what settings they were in, um, contact patterns that they had, uh, mask use inside and outside of school by them and the people they were engaging with um, to answer some questions about school reopenings and the impact that they may have had on community transmission, both in terms of the cases that we can see and those that we cannot. Um, next slide, please. So I uh, 
would really like to thank and acknowledge um, a small army, medium-sized army of people who have contributed to this work over the last year, um, including a number of students um, and investigators across various schools and departments here um, at UNC and funding from the North Carolina Division of Public Health and the North Carolina Policy Collaboratory that have um, supported this work. Happy to take questions. Great, thank you. So we'll turn it over to Dr. Andy Olshan, who will be moderating this section. Section. Did, Karen, did you want any Q and A uh, at this stage or not? Of course. Okay. To open it up uh, for any questions. I think Ralph, you had uh, wanted to answer the question about the Finland uh, vaccines. Or uh, yeah, I tried. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Yeah, it's an adenovirus-based vaccine. It's an adenovirus vector that has a spike like a protein uh, dropped into the virus backbone. They're, they're called single hit vectors, which infect cells, but don't spread beyond that. It'll be delivered intranasally into the nose. So it should make good mucosal immunity uh, in the nose and reduce transmission. Um, uh, how well it, it works would probably be comparable either to uh, the Janssen vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, there was also a question about mosquito uh, transmission, uh, potential uh, possibility for mosquito transmission. Uh, Ralph, do you wanna answer that? I would put it in the exceptional, exceptional, exceptional unlikely ca uh, category. Um, mostly because for a mosquito to transmit virus, they take a blood meal, the virus goes into the gut, uh, replicates in the mosquito, and then goes back to the salivary glands, which takes several days. And coronaviruses don't replicate in insect cells. So it would be exceptionally unlikely that mosquitoes would transmit these viruses from person to person. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have um, uh, is for Dr. Powers. Um, can the models take into account human behavior patterns, i.e. college students going everywhere and those in a nursing home might not be as mobile? And if so, how? Yeah, so depending on the type of model and the, the question that we're asking, um, that certainly is a, human behavior is a huge driver of what we see in terms of transmission. So for example, in that early model that I showed where we were looking at hospitalizations, we used information on mobility um, and, and how far people were moving each day from outside of their homes um, that was available early in the pandemic um, to try to account for changes in human behavior, kind of, a, a, you know, not a very granular level at that point um, and how that could impact uh, spread of the infection and that was we included those sorts of considerations in modeling different scenarios going forward of greater mobility less mobility um, according to different um, restrictions and then certainly there are ways for more granular models that consider age and mixing with different age patterns that could include um, also settings like nursing homes and schools and those sorts of things that, that also certainly are being used in the pandemic to account for differences in behavior over time and place and, and demographic group. Thank you, Kim. Um, our next question is from um, Theodore. Um, he's asked about following up on the nasal vaccine route. What is your view of the Vaxart oral vaccine? I think that's a question for Dr. Bear. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. The Vaxart vaccine is typically an adenovirus-based vaccine that's given orally. We've worked extensively with the company on norovirus vaccines, not on SARS-2 vaccines. So it's an interesting quit twist. It should induce good mucosal immunity. How well it works in the lung and the nasal airway epithelium, I, I would have to look at the data and I don't know. I, I, I haven't followed up on it. But if you need a question, I have a question for Kim too, later on. <laughs> oh, go for it, Ralph. <laughs> All right, Kim, I was just very interested in uh, the impact of these variants and who might be most likely targeted by infection, suggesting, for example, in my talk, 
that asymptomatics and mild infections that have very low titers would be the ones who are susceptible. Have you modeled any of that and, and, and to make any uh, recommendations for how to deal with that, assuming it's correct? Not yet, but I would be interested in talking with you some more about that. We certainly have the you know structures in place where we could look at that um, and, and having the data to go into those models would be helpful as well. So um, yeah, that's something we could do. Haven't done it yet. Okay, good. <laughs> um, another question um, about, uh, this is for uh, Dr. Barrick. Um, how do viral vector vaccines like Johnson & Johnson not get neutralized by antibodies before being able to enter human cells? Um, that's a great question. And it was a, a heavily studied um, a question uh, in, primates, mice, and other animal models of human disease before getting into humans. And even in animal systems that have very high neutralizing titers, um, uh, these adenovirus vectors, which are oftentimes delivered um, uh, via the intranasal route, um, the kinetics of infection are more efficient than the kinetics of neutralization. So. Yes, you do lose some potency uh, because of pre-existing immunity, but, um, but they still can elicit a good immune response. Uh, one of the ways around this, for example, AstraZeneca uses a primate adenovirus as a um, challenge as a vaccine backbone so that uh, it won't uh, be as effectively neutralized by Anisera generated against the 41 adenovirus strains that circulate in people. Other companies use the rare adenovirus strains. And so that's how they kind of also get around that question. Mm -hmm. um, another question that was submitted beforehand, what are the current thoughts on fully vaccinated people being able to still asymptomatically spread SARS-CoV-2 to others? Uh, I mean, yeah, the virus and what the response uh, and would that response to the question differ between Pfizer and Moderna vaccines versus the J&J? &J? Uh, that's a great question. I, uh, um, so the respiratory tract can be envisioned as two bubbles, the lower respiratory tract and the upper respiratory tract. And the ability of antibodies to get into the nose and upper respiratory tract um, is not as efficient as it is in the lower respiratory tract. So the antibodies have to transduce across certain cell types to get into your nasal secretions. And because of that, you need really high titers for that to occur efficiently. And so um, vaccines that elicit lower levels of antibody will be at much lower levels in the nasal secretions and the oropharynx, allowing for limited virus replication. Or if the immune system, the immunity that is elicited by the vaccine wanes, that will also drop over time and allow potential upper respiratory tract infections. And so my guess is that uh, SARS-2 is going to turn into an upper respiratory tract virus uh, associated with the common cold, much like the contemporary human coronavirus is causing humans today. And that's because all the adults will eventually be immune. Uh, children have mild disease and they will be boosted many times before they get older. So uh, that's probably where we're heading, common cold virus. Thank you. That's pretty consistent with what you said last year. Um, I haven't changed. I still oh, could be wrong though. I just, just, just make sure you know that. Okay. It could be terribly wrong too, in, that, in which case, um, yeah, Andy will make sure I'll never be on here again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and a quick question for Kim before we go to our next set of panelists. Um, uh, so um, Mike has a question for you. As the pandemic continues, the policy space has gotten more complicated with schools and gyms and restaurants and the masking requirement. How do you process that or collapse, if at all, that policy space for the models that you're running? Yeah, it's really difficult. And, and I think a, a cha <laughs> I've been modeling for a long, long time. Um, previously, HIV and STIs that were a bit more, um, everything was a bit more, more settled. And we had histories, a, a history of decades of experience with these models and with the infections. And um, so this has been a lot of learning on the fly. Um, and, and 
um, I don't know if I, I don't see the question in writing. Um, so now I can't remember what any of it was, but um, a challenge here has been that a lot of these questions, um, there are so many important questions that can be answered with models, but a lot of them require different levels of detail or different structures. And so trying to keep up with all of the different questions and, and design the right models to answer those questions has been a challenge. Um, and, it, and, and it is completely the case that things do have gotten more complex with more moving parts as time has gone on. Um, in some ways, we have simplified things so that we don't try to model every single piece. Um, and we focus on um, what we know better than other things to focus to focus on the things we know best um, to to model um, certain scenarios certain outcomes that we that we can track really well um, so that's I, that's not really an answer um, but it's it's kind of case by case what we include what we don't include what complexities we try to model what complexities we try to um, summarize in, in more aggregate ways um, as things have become more complex and the relationships between different things like policies and behavior change over time. Thank you, Kim. Um, so we're at 1245, which, so, so we're going to turn to um, share the next presentations and Dr. Audrey Pettifor. Andy, did you want to do introduction? Sure. Sure, thanks, Karen. So I'll introduce uh, briefly our next set of speakers. Uh, first, we'll hear from Dr. Audrey Pettifor, who's a professor of epidemiology. Audrey's an epidemiologist whose research has focused on sexual behavior and determinants of HIV, STI infection in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, recently, she's become engaged in and leading campus COVID-19 projects that you'll hear about shortly. Uh, after Audrey, we'll hear from Dr. Aaron Fleischauer, who's an adjunct professor of epidemiology. Aaron's a CDC career epidemiologist assigned to the North Carolina Public, signed to North Carolina Public Health since 2008, where he serves as chief science officer for the epidemiology section. Aaron began his tenure with the CDC in the EIS class in 2002 after receiving a PhD in epidemiology from UNC. His interests are surveillance for infectious diseases, outbreak response, and applied environmental epidemiology. Epidemiology. Uh, finally, then after Aaron, we will hear from Dr. David Weber. Uh, David's a professor of medicine, pediatrics, and epidemiology, associate chief medical officer of UNC Healthcare, and director of regulatory services for the North Carolina Translational and Clinical Sciences Institute at UNC. His research career is focused on healthcare associated infections, and antibiotic stewardship, and new and emerging diseases. So thanks to, to all our uh, upcoming speakers and we will um, turn over to Audrey. Great, thanks so much, Andy. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I, I remember sitting and watching uh, this a year ago when I um, had nothing to do with COVID research. And um, I guess sometime in April, May, COVID has taken over my life and I kind of feel like HIV what? <laughs> At least for the last year. So um, I'm gonna present here um, a little bit about some of the work we've been doing on the UNC campus and a large study that's about to launch um, across the US and here. So this is from the New York Times. If you haven't followed, they have great data on kind of what we saw in the fall on college campuses. And we saw as we know from our own lived experience here at UNC, a very high number of cases of COVID on college campuses across the United States. So over 375,000 infections last fall in over 1800 colleges and um, I think over 40 colleges and universities that had more than a thousand cases in the fall. Next slide. So, you know, we know that young people have high levels of infection. And I guess what, what we also know now that perhaps isn't as surprising is that, you know, most of these infections tend to be asymptomatic. We don't tend to see severe disease in younger people. But between August and September last fall, COVID cases increased 55% nationally among those 18 to 22 in the US. That was sort of timed when universities were opening in a lot of places on campus, including UNC. Um, and you can see the numbers there. Actually, there were 85 more universities that had more than 1,000 cases, and that was by the end of the year. So I'm sure there's many more now. Um, and up to 40% of people with infection, and I saw Ralph had even higher numbers, are estimated to be asymptomatic. And, and young people, as I said, are more likely to be asymptomatic. Next slide. 
Um, so not only do young people sometimes maybe not recognize that they have COVID or how sick they are, I will say like just anecdotally from some of the people showing, you know, telling us they're asymptomatic. And then when we probe them saying, well, actually I had this symptom, but kind of not recognizing that as severe enough to consider themselves symptomatic. But we've seen that outbreaks on college campuses have been associated with students residing in high density housing, socializing off campus and not following social distancing guidelines. That's actually from um, uh, MMWR from our outbreak um, the last fall. Young people 18 to 29 and, and research done um, in the US have we've found have been less likely to adhere to COVID prevention measures than older adults. And pretty good data showing that infections in young people in the Southern US preceded infections in older adults by about four to 15 days. So we certainly are seeing sort of high incidence um, in young people. There was a nice analysis that was published um, just earlier this year showing that university counties that had in-person instruction were associated with an increase in COVID cases 21 days after the start of classes compared to the day to before classes started compared to universities where they were remote or um, they didn't have universities at all in those counties. Um, and some of those places actually saw declines. Um, there's also one study which um, I don't yet know, it's, it's been sort of in preprint for a while and there was some questioning of the methods, but showing phylogenetic data from Wisconsin documenting infection from university students to skilled nursing facilities where there actually were deaths in those nursing facilities. So, you know, real concern about whether young people could be vectors for infection in communities. Um, certainly we've seen sort of, yeah, the stress that um, university reopening policies can have on communities. Next slide. So this, I guess, it must have been sort of May last year. Many of you may uh, know that our sort of research operations have been really scaled back and there were only very few people on campus who were still on campus doing um, essential research, including Dr. Barrick's lab and, and a few others. But there was a question of, could we bring the research community back to campus safely? And so through the collaboratory, the North Carolina Collaboratory, um, a number of folks got together and um, started to decide to look at this question to see whether, you know, what kind of levels of infection were we seeing in our research community on campus? Next slide. So the, the main objective of the of this study was to see if prevention measures that were being implemented on campus um, were effective in, in reducing the spread of SARS-CoV-2 on campus and in the research community. And then we had a number of secondary objectives that we wanted to look at. So barriers and facilitators to actual adoption of prevention measures in the workplace, um, looking at risk factors for spread of SARS-CoV-2. And we really were hoping that if we identified cases that we could interrupt them quickly so that we wouldn't see spread on campus. Next slide. So we recruited staff, faculty, and students who were coming to campus and were um, conducting or supporting research on campus. So they only had to, you know, we sort of said, are you on campus like on average one day a week at a minimum, it could be more, but we wanted to kind of open it up to, to that group. And we ran the study between July of 2020 and December, the end of the year. And there was a baseline visit, a one month visit and a three month visit. Um, at those visits, participants did a online survey and we did serology at baseline one and three months. And then we did an observed um, mid turbinate nasal swab for PCR, which was done at those time points. And then we also asked people in between to try to do it sort of every two weeks um, to look at, at active virus. Next slide. So this is just showing you at baseline and at the three month visit kind of what behaviors were like on campus and are in this population. And overall prevention behaviors on campus are really good. I will say that the percentage who said they always wore a mask was a little bit lower, but when we followed up to ask why, if you didn't always wear a mask, it was essentially people saying, I'm alone in my office, there's no one around. And that's you know why I'm not wearing a mask all the time. Um, Really, most people felt like their coworkers were wearing masks all of the time. You know, I think a, a number of our participants in the study are clinicians. So I think in terms of people coming close to them, you know, they don't really get to control that. And, you know, the only thing that we saw that, you know, maybe was a little bit concerning was eating indoors um, with others without masks. And I know David can speak to early on, that's where some of the, if we, if, although there was minimal spread on campus in the workplace, that was one of 
the factors that was seen was spread on campus with eating without masks. So that was the one thing we have kind of emphasized um, for messaging. Next slide. And I think behaviors bore out what we saw. So over this whole time period where there were over close to 3000 PCR tests that we ran and we only had five people who tested positive on the research PCR tests throughout this time period. Um, we referred all people to the McClendon lab um, for confirmatory PCR testing and none of those came back positive. And I think we can talk about what that means. At the time we were not totally sure, but I think now we know in terms of viral dynamics and I will emphasize all these people are asymptomatic. So none of these folks are symptomatic. And I think we really know now that asymptomatic individuals can shed virus for a very short period of time. So, you know, it's possible between when we detected virus, especially if it was low level and when they got their confirmatory test um, that they were no longer detectable. Um, next slide. We also used serology and we worked with um, uh, Prem Lakshmane's lab and Dr. Arvinda de Silva's lab. And on their assay, we saw 5% prevalence of um, people who had antibodies at baseline. And between baseline and three months, we saw that 3.7% of individuals seroconverted. Um, so I think um, if we go to the next slide, I think one of the interesting conclusions here is just in terms of survey, I mean, if you wanna see this as surveillance, but sort of infrequent PCR testing in a workplace is not that informative. If you're trying to use that to figure out, you know, how many people, um, have infection, you know, because clearly our, the PCR testing we were doing once every two weeks roughly picked up very few infections, while the serology actually identified a lot, a lot more individuals who theoretically had infection over, over those three months, um, you know, but in general, we saw low risk in the research community on campus. So conducting research on campus with the precautions that were in place seemed to be low risk for COVID transmission. Um, despite, you know, this, this all happened when we saw that huge spike in August of cases in, in students. So definitely seeming like those populations were distinct and different. Um, and, you know, that, that uh, conducting research on campus during that time appeared to be relatively safe. Next slide. So we've actually been doing um, a number of, we, we, we have a, a serology study happening with undergraduates right now that we're actually in the process of about to conduct a second round with them of testing um, with, with surveys. And I'm not gonna present that today in the interest of time, but what I do wanna present to you is a new study that is um, being conducted with the COVID Prevention Network and it's called Prevent COVID U for Universities. Um, and I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of, of this study. Um, next slide. Um, I wanna just acknowledge my co-chairs, Katie Stevenson from Beth Israel um, at Harvard and Jasmine Marcelin from University of Nebraska and then um, the COVPN leadership um, and our statistical team at the Fred Hutch in Seattle. Next slide. Um, this study actually right now, there's about 20 universities across the US who are going to be involved, but this is the team here at UNC. So UNC is one of the sites and um, Dr. Sylvia becker Drops and Dr. Nadia Viole are the um, site PIs here at UNC along with a number of folks that you probably know who are co-investigators here. Next slide. So this trial really emanates from the question of you know, I think I, one of the questions you guys have already asked, so do COVID vaccines reduce asymptomatic infection and transmission? And what, what do we know about the current vaccines and, you know, all of the CDC guidelines that have come out about, you know, what you can and can't do once you're vaccinated. Um, so we've shown, you know, these, the trials were designed to see if, if the vaccines could prevent symptomatic disease, right? So what we often call vaccine efficacy against disease, and that's what they were designed to show. Um, and we've seen that they've been effective across multiple platforms. And as I think um, Ralph showed, mainly in the context of the original strain of the virus is you know, where we've seen efficacy. There's much less data on how effective they are with some of the other newer strains. Um, and again, where we do have data, they seem a little less effective at preventing mild and moderate illness against new variants. Um, we also know that you know there's some data coming out that these that, that the vaccines um, are effective against asymptomatic infection, viral load in the nose, and secondary. But these things are not yet. So we have some data on asymptomatic infections, but I've actually seen some epidemiologists can even confusing that 
with transmission. And just to be clear that, you know, asymptomatic infection is not the same as transmission. We don't have data on that yet. We can, we can sort of estimate, okay, if you don't get infected, if you have no infection, you're not going to transmit it to other people. Um, but we have really spotty data and the data that's been collected has been a little bit, um, uh, not super rigorous, let's put it that way. So we're, we have emerging data showing that these vaccines are, are effective at present, preventing um, asymptomatic infection, but um, it's, not, it's not super well established. Um, and clearly there's a ton of policy questions about you know, what do we, can we or can't we do um, once individuals are vaccinated? Next question, uh, next slide. So this trial, COVID-PN3006 is a randomized study to evaluate the Moderna vaccine on infectiousness. So it's um, going to be recruiting 12,000 students in the US stratified one-to-one -to, -one to be getting the Moderna vaccine immediately or asking individuals who enroll to delay getting the vaccine. Um, and those individuals that enroll are being asked to recruit close contacts prospectively. And then if they get infected, they're also being asked to sort of recruit what we're calling case ascertained close contacts. So individuals, you know, let's say I en en enroll my roommates if I'm in the trial, but then I went to like, I don't know, watch um, a basketball game at a friend's house the day before I found out I was positive. I could invite those people to be in the study as well. Next slide. And so the primary objectives of the study are evaluating the efficacy of SARS-CoV-2 against infection, and this includes all infections. So we are asking participants in the trial to swab their noses daily for four months, which is no small ask of college students. So um, they will be collecting swabs every day, which will be tested for virus. And then we're evaluating the magnitude and duration of viral shedding um, among those with incident SARS-CoV-2. So really trying to look at vaccine efficacy um, on peak viral load and other shedding um, uh, metrics. Next slide. And then there's a number of secondary objectives related to the vaccine efficacy and secondary transmission on viral load, um, how vaccine efficacy affects viral load and secondary transmission for symptomatic, say, versus asymptomatic infections, um, what we see with seroconversion, disease, and immune correlates of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And, you know, we're really trying to recruit sites right now. We have a special emphasis on trying to get more schools from the Northeast so that we can capture the New York variant, which there's a lot of concern about how well the, um, the, the vaccines are going to be against the New York variant. Next slide. Just to point out that diversity inclusion is really important for us in this trial, given the disproportionate burden um, in BIPOC communities, we want to ensure access to the vaccine for these communities. So we actually have a number of historically black colleges and universities that are participating in this trial um, with recruitment materials that are tailored to these communities. And we have a youth advisory board that consists of participants from all of the universities to be giving us kind of youth voices and ensure that recruitment and retention address the concerns of students. Next slide. Um, and just to point out kind of if you look at the demographics of the US um, where infections were projected to be in April of 2021 and mask use and then you can see these little dots are kind of where our universities are across the US. And again, we're trying to get more in the New York area right now, um, really trying to capture kind of the diversity of the US. Next slide. I think it's my last slide. So just if any students are interested, this is who can participate. Any student 18 to 26 who hasn't had COVID and is planning to be around um, the Chapel Hill, Carborough, greater area through the summer. Um, and we're hoping to enroll about 600 students here at UNC. And last slide, if you have any questions, um, you can email and be expecting to see official sort of recruitment materials for the study coming out later this week. Um, so we'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks, Audrey. So we will move to Aaron. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Aaron Fleischauer with North Carolina Public Health. And where are we a year later? I'm going to try and tell you the COVID story here in North Carolina, recognizing that there are a lot of chapters to this story. And I'm only going to cover a few chapters from the front lines of applied public health and a lot of this data has come at great expense to the dozens of epidemiologists here in North Carolina Public Health who've worked thousands of hours of overtime in this response and much credit and respect goes out to them. 
Um, this figure is a common figure most folks have seen, just documenting the antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 exposure. Um, we've used this in um, a number of our guided responses in terms of how long do I have antibody detection after exposure um, and uh, potentially uh, in the acute and long-term phase. And the other pieces of information we've learned so far in the past year is up to 40 to 50 percent of these infections are truly asymptomatic, has been covered elsewhere. We know that this is not just a respiratory disease, it's a multi-organ disease um, that's actually quite unique from other viruses. It causes um, an inflammatory process um, that has been documented quite interestingly in multi-system uh, inflammatory responses similar to Kawasaki's disease in children. Um, and disease severity has been modified by age and a number of comorbidities. Um, interestingly, reinfection to date appears relatively rare, although the detection of reinfection generally requires um, genetic sequencing and observing that the sequence strains are in fact different. So um, we're not doing a heck of a lot of uh, sequencing and we'll be ramping that up as we speak. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Next slide. So let's talk about the North Carolina story. Next slide. Here is the epidemic curve for North Carolina. As of a few days ago, we were crossing the 900,000 cases threshold here in North Carolina. And you can clearly see, if you remember back last, oh, the beginning of last summer where we experienced our first wave of the pandemic. Um, and then we had a, another smaller wave in the beginning of university and college reopenings. And you can see here this um, much larger curve, many magnitudes um, larger than the previous waves following the holiday season, um, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and the New Year's. And we can talk a little bit about why. And thankfully, as of just last week, we are um, approaching perhaps a plateau um, that puts us somewhere either last summer or prior to the initial wave, which is very exciting. And a credit to all of you on this call who are participating in our mitigation strategies. Next slide. Okay, and this is that same epidemic curve stratified by age. And we can clearly see that as of the university and college reopenings of that spike here in August, um, and that was college students. And um, as it translated to the big curve around the holiday season, again, that was mostly driven by younger ages. And I wanna direct your attention to this teal colored 65 plus and older curve. And you can see the effect of vaccine in that population. And I think that's very exciting to see in our descriptive epi that that group was paralleling the other age groups, but have now dipped to the lowest incidence age group. Um, and children have been consistently the lowest age group. And that's probably a function of asymptomatic illness in children and um, a number of pathologic factors associated with um, susceptibility to the virus in that age group. Next slide. So I want to draw your attention to a number of health equities we've observed during the past year. And clearly, we were um, st stricken by the uh, differential distributions in race early on. And we attributed this as a function of um, frontline workers or the people who are most at risk um, in the community were um, African Americans, Hispanics, um, American Indian and Native Alaskans. Um, and those persons were the ones who had the highest incidence rates really throughout the entire pandemic. And you can see in the Hispanic non-Hispanic curve here on the right-hand side, um, Hispanics were greatly at increased risk early on. And as I mentioned, um, they made up um, large proportions of frontline workers. And thankfully, if you look at the far right of both of these curves, we see some convergence. Next slide. All right, uh, a lot of attention is being placed on um, return to school right now. And this is our educational clusters and outbreaks. 
And these are clusters and outbreaks, not case incidents. Um, clusters and outbreaks are generally defined quite loosely as five or more cases in space and time. And if you draw your attention here to the August to, oh, almost October, November timeframe, clusters and outbreaks were primarily seen in the college and university setting. Um, that changed um, really as schools started opening up again. And can we go to the next slide? I think you'll see a little bit more information on the next slide. Sorry. Um, we can see here that these are the numbers of clusters and outbreaks in elementary and middle and high school settings. Um, but if you multiply the numbers of clusters times the average number of cases associated with each cluster, that's still a tiny fraction of the total number of cases here in North Carolina. And I think how we can interpret this is um, a pandemic is driven by cases and clusters, uh, clusters and outbreaks, excuse me. Um, the proportion of clusters and outbreaks we saw in the college, university, high school, middle school setting is far smaller than the clusters and outbreaks we saw in the community setting like long-term care facilities, jails and prisons, bars, restaurants, that kind of thing. So in all of this cluster and outbreak surveillance, um, I think what we can translate this in, we had a lower incidence in the elementary and middle school sector. Next slide. So the big question now that we're turning our attention into is what kind of cumulative immunity or immunity in the community have we developed after all of this infection and now vaccine? Now, if you look at the first circle here, 18%, this comes from our network of seroprevalence studies that we initiated with UNC, Duke, East Carolina, um, and Wake Forest Baptist. And from all of those studies, um, as of, oh, maybe late last month, we can potentially estimate that up to 18% of the North Carolina population has been infected and um, has developed to some extent antibodies, neutralizing antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. When we add our vaccine campaign, campaign to this, we're looking at the middle circle, um, and this number is increasing beyond 17%, it's over 20% now of North Carolinians have been vaccinated with at least the first dose and developed neutralizing antibodies. These are non-mutually exclusive, of course. Um, we can potentially conclude that 30% or greater of the North Carolina population now possesses neutralizing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, which is exciting because we can say upwards of a third of the population, um, if we think of a pandemic as a series or network of transmission pathways are now by definition, hopefully dead end hosts um, where there won't be upregulation or uh, I'm sorry, uh, reproduction of the virus and transmission onwards. Um, are we approaching herd immunity? No, but are we approaching a level of immunity where it's flattening the curve? Yes, likely. Next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about deaths. We're now uh, approaching 12,000 deaths here in North Carolina. Um, and the death rate has consistently paralleled the incidence rate. Next slide. This is the death rate stratified by race and ethnicity. We, we look at the figure on the left. Um, we did in fact see a slightly higher um, death rate associated with African-American. Uh, than white because African-Americans represent about 22% of North Carolinians with a death rate of 25%. Um, however, um, we did not necessarily see, see that same death rate translate in Hispanic population. And um, one of the potential reasons for this is uh, the additional factor of aging comor comorbidities. Next slide. Talk a little bit about variants. We've talked a lot about that today. We'll talk a little bit about the distribution of variants across the world. And I think uh, Ralph did a really nice job summarizing the different variants. We're primarily tracking the B117 or UK variant, which is associated with increased transmission. But hopefully, as um, that virus continues to be studied, minimal impact on neutralization. The B1351 South African strain 
also associated with increased transmission may have a more moderate impact on neutralization. The P1, which is the Japanese slash Brazilian strain, very similar to the B1351 in terms of its impact on neutralization. And a number of new strains are being identified here in the US, one in California, another one recently identified in Minnesota. Next slide. And this is our sequencing um, of the different strains here in North Carolina. And this is primarily conducted through a number of commercial labs, the state lab here of public health and um, additional sequencing done at CDC. Now we can see almost a linear increase in these variants up until um, last month, the B117 is uh, a larger proportion of our lineage detection here. Um, and I think if we continue this onward into March, April, we're continuing to see um, a larger market share of the variants. It's just a natural predictor because of their increased transmissibility. And like the UK saw, um, we do expect at some point the B117 probably to become the dominant strain here in North Carolina at some point. Next slide. A little bit on vaccine, but more on vaccine distribution. You'll find this on our website. This is hopefully up to date of our vaccine distribution here in North Carolina, um, where we've administered, if I'm looking for the total number of doses administered, and it's um, well over 2 million. And that translates, thankfully, North Carolina has a population denominator of 10 million. So you can do the quick math here and demonstrate that upwards of 20% of the population has already received their first dose, dose. And this is very exciting. Now, how does this translate into health equity? Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, let's skip this slide. I just said it. Okay. So early on, um, when the vaccine first started coming out, we observed um, a, a quite a wide um, health equity gap. And we've worked very hard to reduce that gap. And I, I give tremendous credit to the folks here at the State Health Department um, who've worked with a lot of community organizations to increase vaccine uptake in marginalized populations. And if you follow these curves onwards, you'll see some convergence. And we have a much greater uptake among um, African-American populations. Um, and I think North Carolina is um, highlighted by White House and others um, as a state that has taken considerable strides in reducing health equity in not only um, the incidence of disease, but also the vaccine administration. And that's, I think, a, a really exciting success story. Next slide. Okay. So everyone's heard this. This is the new, what can I do after my vaccine? And there's been a lot of discussion of when can we return to normal? And well, we might have to define a slightly new normal moving on. Um, but I don't know if it's gonna look hugely different from the old normal other than taking some additional precautions and hopefully you've learned some healthy behaviors in terms of uh, hygiene that we can continue to manifest um, that may reduce other viruses as well. But you can gather indoors with fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask. You can gather indoors with unvaccinated people from one other household without masks, um, unless there are high risk people, of course. And this goes on to describe additional guidance. One question we continue to, to get is how long am I gonna have to wear a mask for? And I don't know if, if I have a true answer for that. Um, I responded with CDC to the initial SARS outbreak in 2003 in Singapore. And I can tell you when you go back to Asia now, you still see, well, prior to COVID, you still see people wearing masks. So I think uh, to some extent in public settings of, of people who are high risk, we may still encourage mask use. But in the general population, um, after we have considerable vaccine uptake, that's going to be an important question that we'll have to answer that we might not have the answer to right now. Next slide. So we wanna to continue to emphasize prevention, 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 until we get that 30 plus percent immunity well in excess of hopefully 60 to 70%. And if Dr. Barrick is correct, this virus becomes considerable to what we see with flu. 
uh, we see an annual seizure, seasonal pattern with hopefully a low um, hospitalization and death rate. But we will continue to recommend prevention following the three W's, wearing a mask, um, that six feet is now potentially three feet. Um, some restrictions on mass gatherings and also continuing to hand hygiene. So thank you so much. If you have questions, I think we'll have uh, Dr. Weber and then we'll have time for questions. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, Aaron. David? Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today, and I'll take the next slide. Thank you. So obviously, you've already seen the data. Uh, cases worldwide continue to rise, but at a slightly slower rate and have surpassed 110 million. And you've already seen that we're still in our first wave, unlike the 1918-19 uh, 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 outbreak of influenza. But we're in the third surge, which is uh, substantially less. But notice that in the last few weeks, we have stabilized at about uh, 50,000 cases a day. And you've already heard about uh, in the United States uh, that we represent 20 to 25 percent of the world's cases and deaths. Next slide. I just want to quickly talk to you about uh, the mitigation efforts uh, that we all need to be doing. Uh, the risk of our getting COVID depends on our personal protection, wearing a mask. If you're uninfected, wearing a mask. If you are infected, masks uh, decrease the expulsion of, uh, uh, of viral particles. Uh, being outdoors with turbulent air, large air spaces, sun, the ultraviolet destroying the envelope virus, and time is all important. Uh, CDC calls exposure 15 minutes in shared air space within six feet uh, for 24 hours. And the risk is reduced uh, by physical distancing, wearing masks, hand hygiene, surface disinfection, and now vaccines. Next slide. I just want to show you some of our data. Uh, this is a uh, 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 Dr. Bennett is a lead aerosol engineer who's designed, who's done these studies uh, here at UNC, uh, along with uh, those of us in addiction prevention. This particular study was improving efficiency of community masks. You'll notice in the upper right, just taking a regular uh, standard medical mask without an aluminum nose bridge and then adding that improves the efficiency of the mask uh, by about 50 percent from 40 to 60 percent. You'll notice down in the lower right uh, that just by a variety of simple methods, uh, you can take a, a standard medical mask and improve its uh, efficiency up to 80%, uh, getting much closer to what we call an N95 uh, respirator. So when I talk about double masking, I'm talking about if you're uninfected, wear a mask, and if you're infected, wear a mask. Next slide. So this is Dr. Bennett, uh, one of our uh, aerosol engineers. Uh, uh, I'm one of our uh, professors here at the university, uh, just wearing a variety of masks that are quite common in the, uh, uh, in the community, including one sold at UNC. Next slide. And then, uh, oh, go back. Uh, so, uh, uh, so what you can do is, we don't have that slide there, is you can increase the fit of the mask uh, just by uh, putting uh, a hair clips around it or tying it more tightly and substantially increasing uh, the fit. Do these things work and are they independent or associated? Well, this was a nice study uh, in Thailand, 200 cases, roughly 850 controls. This is out in the community. Uh, they showed that uh, your contact place, boxing, uh, stadium, workplace, nightclub was not significant. Age was not significant. But if you were one meter uh, more away, uh, duration of uh, contact, uh, less than 15 minutes, not smoking, hand washing often, but not none or sometimes, and wearing a mask uh, all the time, that substantially reduced the risk of acquiring COVID. This is where we get our mitigation strategy. So wearing a mask, maintaining one meter, which of course, you know, is the new guideline uh, for the uh, uh, CDC for K through 12 schools, having close contact for less than 15 minutes, and frequent hand hygiene were all independently associated with the lower risk of infection. So the mitigation strategies that are recommended uh, really do work and they are additive. Of those, the most important is wearing, uh, wearing a mask. I wanna point out uh, that in terms of there's new strategy for K through 12 schools, it does uh, list the, um, uh, the same mitigation strategies we talked about, but it only has reduced the physical distancing to three feet uh, I've been part of the ABC program uh, with Duke uh, that has studied uh, 
these issues in schools here in North Carolina. So as you've already heard, following these mitigation strategies, there have been very few uh, clusters uh, within the K through 12 uh, schools. Uh, you can see here in our study, uh, over nine weeks, 11 participating uh, stu uh, school districts from more than 90,000 students, uh, 773 community-acquired SARS-CoV-2 infections documented by molecular te testing. Through contact tracing, North Carolina Health Department staff determined additional 32 infections were acquired within schools. Importantly, no instances of child-to-adult transmission were reported in the schools. And in the first uh, nine weeks of in-person instruction in North Carolina, we found extremely limited within school secondary transmission as determined by contact tracing. So yes, with the proper mitigation strategies, most K through 12 schools uh, can open up at least uh, partially uh, to in-person transmission uh, as is demonstrated by the new CDC guidelines. Next slide. Again, you've already seen this, uh, that in SARS-CoV-2, roughly 40% are asymptomatic, and then uh, of the 85% to 80-85% symptomatic, 15% of severe disease and 5% move to critical disease. Next slide. And so I just want to point out that this is a multi-system uh, disease uh, with uh, not just affecting the lungs, but has uh, widespread effects on the body, and we need to deal with that when those patients come into our hospital. Next slide. Again, uh, uh, these are the NIH and IDSA guidelines. The point here is not to look at that, just that we've incorporated these guidelines into our treatment guidelines at the hospital. We're on version about 22 of our treatment guidelines based on uh, NIH and IDSA guidelines. Next slide. And so in the early phase of the disease, we use monoclonal antibodies in outpatients. We've given it to more than 2,000 uh, individuals. Uh, through our infusion centers across our healthcare system. Later on, we use plasma, which passively provides antibodies as well. Remdesivir, you've already heard from uh, uh, Dr. Barrick, is used for patients uh, who come into the hospital as well. Then we move to dextamethasone as well if they require oxygen, uh, a steroid. And finally, we have newer therapies such as tolazuzumab and other anti-inflammatory agents for people who have more severe disease and are having a cytokine storm that leads to the uh, 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 widespread organ problems that we've already mentioned. Next slide. In terms of vaccines, our, uh, our uh, ethical principles, maximize the benefits, minimize harms, mitigate health inequities, promote justice, and promote transparency, as recommended by CDC. Next slide. And uh, you've, we've already gone through that. We've moved to phase four for uh, providing vaccines, group four, uh, people uh, 16 to 64 with high-risk conditions. Next slide. Uh, just uh, briefly about the vaccines. They can be mRNA. We have two of those and one adenovirus vectored vaccine, many, many others under development at the moment. Next slide. Uh, we are giving these vaccines at UNC Health. Uh, there are slight differences. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is one dose adenovirus uh, recombinant vaccine, have, but uh, in addition to only being a single dose, it has lower side effects. Uh, it has somewhat less effectiveness for moderate to severe illness, but all three vaccines are 100% effective for preventing hospitalizations and deaths. Next slide. Uh, I do want to point out that in those trials, uh, there were substantial uh, numbers of uh, uh, historically disadvantaged individuals, uh, black individuals with 10%, a little under their uh, national uh, percentage, but Hispanic and Latinx were somewhat overrepresented, in part because some of the trial sites were in South America. Next slide. Here are the sites for UNC Health that we're providing vaccine. You can see the little uh, uh, bus there. We are providing vaccine to historically disadvantaged communities uh, in a mobile van. Next slide. And I do want to point out uh, that, uh, go back to that slide just for one second, if you don't mind, that we've now uh, surpassed 250,000 doses administered. You just heard uh, a moment ago uh, from uh, Aaron Fleischauer uh, that they've given roughly 2 million doses across the state. So I want to point out to you that UNC Health has provided about 12.5%, uh, one in eight, all vaccines provided all across North Carolina have been provided by UNC Health. Next slide. You've heard earlier about the uh, problems of inequities uh, uh, with vaccine. UNC has been a leader 
uh, in dealing with those, uh, led by Dr. Sene, our uh, executive uh, vice dean for uh, diversity. The goals are to provide, and we monitor this literally on a daily basis, uh, inequities in vaccine distribution uh, with uh, every possible attempt to capture black and uh, 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 Latinx individuals, as well as those in uh, lower socioeconomic classes who may not have the ability to drive uh, to vaccine centers. And we've been working very hard to work with those uh, marginalized uh, communities, and we have an entire task force working to do that. Next slide. So again, uh, these are some of the, we work with patient-directed scheduling, provider-directed scheduling, trying to reach those disadvantaged individuals who may have low-tech, uh, non-access uh, to our electronic medical records uh, through a whole variety of techniques uh, there. Next slide. And you can see here, this is our uh, dashboard uh, there looking at uh, uh, vaccine hubs. And you can see here uh, monitoring whether we are, uh, how underrepresented some of our groups are uh, and uh, how we're doing. And so we monitor this on a, a daily basis under one. Uh, means we've underrepresented them. And this was true when we first uh, started working on this uh, uh, several months ago, but we've continually improved our representation of disadvantaged groups in uh, vaccine uh, uh, equity, and we've worked very hard to improve that. Next slide. Uh, there, I just want to point out this one trial of Pfizer. We talked earlier about vaccines. We don't know if they prevent you from becoming infected or infectious. Here's a very large uh, trial with roughly 600,000 people in each group, case control uh, format. Uh, in, uh, in Israel, down in the lower left, you can see seven days after the second dose, it was 92% effective for, for preventing documented infection. Next slide. And if you go in and look at the, uh, their uh, supplement, you would see uh, uh, seven days after the second dose of vaccine, it was 90% effective for preventing asymptomatic infection. Uh, we really look forward to the studies uh, across the system led by Dr. Pettifor and here at UNC uh, by uh, Dr. Sylvia beckett Drops to really uh, put more science behind the studies of vaccine effectiveness uh, for preventing asymptomatic infection. Although the data does suggest that the current available vaccines are 75 to 90 percent effective in preventing such infection. Next slide. Uh, uh, the variants, you've already heard that. I just uh, focus on the lower left. We are monitoring the variants here. We do sequence all the uh, cases we've had. This is already a few weeks old, but you can see uh, uh, of our first 300 cases at UNC Medical Center uh, we had, uh, uh, that we did uh, sequencing on. Seven were the UK strain, one was the South African strain, and one was the uh, New York strain. And we continue to monitor here uh, all of our uh, cases at UNC, sequencing all of them now. Next slide. Just remind you about uh, community protection called herd immunity. Don't like the term. We're not cows and people who are susceptible uh, are not immune. And we're really in that middle bucket where uh, you've heard about 30% of the population natural disease or uh, uh, having had vaccine. But uh, those people are protected, but it can still spread through the community. What we need to do is move to the thresholds on the right at about 85% to being uh, infected or with vaccine to really get some community protection. So that will occur sometime this summer, likely. But keep in mind, that's only relative. Uh, uh, people who are susceptible can still acquire disease. Next slide. And just to end with this slide of modeling. So we get to that level faster by increasing our vaccines. Uh, we get to that level, unfortunately, faster uh, by uh, leaving limiting uh, mask mandates, but that's at the threshold of more people getting sick and dying. And so, yes, we could reach herd immunity, uh, community protection faster, but at the cost of one to 200,000 Americans uh, uh, dying. I think that was my uh, last slide. Oh, I just want to mention this. UNC does have a post-care recovery clinic. It's been up and functioning since mid-January, led by Dr. Barada in physical medicine and rehab. Uh, today, by the way, uh, UNC will submit a very long and detailed uh, response and grant uh, to NIH. They have made approximately $1.1 billion available directly from uh, congressional uh, appropriation to study this uh, post-COVID sequelae. 
and we will be submitting a very detailed clinical and basic science grant that'll go in today. Uh, but there are many, about a third, 30% of patients post-COVID have symptoms that can linger for months, uh, and this can occur in people who've had mild disease that didn't require hospitalization. So our clinic uh, is an excellent, uh, I think the first one in North Carolina, and uh, we uh, are expecting uh, to be able to do substantial research uh, in this area of post-COVID sequelae. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, uh, David and all the speakers. So we're in uh, sort of the overtime here, but we hope to go for another uh, five or 10 minutes if folks can hang on. We've gotten a lot of questions uh, uh, prior to the, the meeting and today, and unfortunately won't be able to get through all of them, but I'll I'll try and get a question out to each of this last set of speakers. So one thing we haven't talked a lot about is the global situation. And uh, at least my observation has been in the mainstream media, not, not a lot's been said about what's going on in Africa. So I thought uh, somebody, an epidemiologist who, who's quite familiar with uh, working in Africa, ask Audrey to comment on the situation. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Actually, and I didn't mention, we have a, a, a Gillings um, Innovation Award to do some um, COVID surveillance in one of our sites in the northeastern part of South Africa um, with doctors Kathy Khan and um, Steve Tolman, who've been working with the National Institute of Communicable Diseases in South Africa. And I, you know, um, South Africa has really seen two waves. So, you know, they didn't see, they had very strict lockdowns there early on and, and didn't see infections and saw sort of a, a, a large spike kind of in July, August, and then it sort of went away again. And then over the holiday period there in December, again, saw a much um, more severe kind of wave, if you will. And interestingly, despite having the variant there and, and hardly any vaccine access, um, again, cases have gone down dramatically there. So, which, which is good news. Um, you know, from my colleagues there, what's interesting is that at least in the populations that they have observed, um, they see a lot more asymptomatic infection. So they've seen about 70, 80% of individuals in their surveillance being asymptomatic. Um, and that may be, a, you know, I, you all may have heard, you know, why is mortality lower in some of the low and middle income countries than we've seen in the US or other places. And it may be heavily weighted to the younger age, age structure of those populations that tend to be much younger. There are some other sort of circulating hypotheses as to why the mortality isn't as high. I don't think any of those have been proven. Um, but yeah, I, I think that they you know, can be commended, at least South Africa, I think can be commended on kind of their, and, and a number of other countries in the African region that I can speak to on their rapid response um, in terms of, of lockdown and, and kind of controlling the epidemic. I think the biggest issue now is fighting for vaccine equity and access. And, um, you know, if you've been following that, I think there's a lot of, of you know, um, global advocacy around ensuring that that we don't see what we saw with HIV, where, you know, better off, better, better resource countries sort of had access to life-saving drugs while, while um, less resource countries were not able to access them. So hopefully that is something that will change um, in the next year and that we'll have you know, more programs that provide um, access to vaccines. Okay, great, thanks, Audrey. A question uh, for uh, uh, David and uh, maybe as it might relate to the help from the state, uh, to Aaron, how can we connect with UNC Health to partner on vaccine delivery in our own communities? I'm in the western part of the state and work with rural and BIPOC communities. So uh, anyone who wants to can send me uh, an email and I'll connect them with our vaccine leadership uh, led by uh, Dr. Tony Lindsay, our system chief medical officer and Ian Buchanan, president of our outpatient uh, system. I should also say separate from what UNC Health is doing, the UNC University College System uh, has, uh, uh, has up and running vaccine centers on several of its uh, rural campuses, as well as historically black universities, uh, separately in an attempt to reach historically uh, disadvantaged communities, as well as rural communities uh, uh, across the state. And I can, uh, if they send me an email, I can direct that to those who are leading the university effort as well. Great. Thanks, David. So there's an interesting question that came in the pre-registration or the pre-meeting list 
that uh, you know I'll put out there for anybody to respond to. There are many areas where public health messaging on COVID can improve. What are the most important messages now that need retooling or, or are completely missing from the public discourse? Well, I'll start with that very quickly. The first is in terms of vaccines, the question we get, which is the best vaccine, and the best vaccine is one you can get as soon as possible. So that's the simple take home message for vaccines. The second is, uh, uh, you know, we've stabilized the, to the cases, but at an enormously high level of 50,000 cases a day across the United States. We can see light at the end of the tunnel, but this is not the time to reduce our uh, vigilance uh, and mitigation efforts, particularly wearing a mask. So people with the few exceptions now listed by the CDC, for fully immunized people in a small bubble visiting another small bubble, people need to wear masks 100% of the time uh, when they are outside of their, uh, their bubble. And we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, not only does it protect you, but if you're asymptomatically infected or mildly symptomatic, you're protecting others from acquiring what can be a deadly disease. So to me, those are the two take home messages. Okay, thank you. Other thoughts from our panelists on public health messaging? Okay. Thanks. Um, we're, uh, we may have a COVID seminar fatigue now setting in, but um, uh, thanks everybody for I'm looking at the, uh, the Q&A box here. Um, so why don't we, I think this may be a, a good time. We're, we're a little bit, uh, you know, over time here to maybe close out the seminar. And, uh, you know, before Karen gives her thanks, I would like to uh, make sure we give a, a a big round of uh, virtual applause to Karen Yates, who uh, who uh, put this all together for us. So thank you so much, Karen. Uh, thank you, Andy. I'm just uh, happy that you all could join us. And uh, it's just really great for us to, for so many of us who all get questions about this, that, that then I think like with hearing from all of our panelists that we can then um, share that information more broadly with our, our um, colleagues and friends, family and loved ones, um, you know, to help combat all the misinformation and science around COVID-19. Um, so I did want to really give a huge shout out to Drs. Barrick, Powers, Pettifor, Weber and Fleischauer for joining us today and giving their time. Really um, appreciate all their uh, wisdom and insight that they're bringing in the science from the front lines. Um, and then to our moderator, Andy Olshin, um, who uh, has uh, helped with the, the like, uh, the initial concept of having the original uh, seminar last year and 19 days ago. And then also a big shout out to the Dean's Office at the Gilling School of Global Public Health for um, their support and particularly Elizabeth French um, and Chrisanna Hughes uh, and um, also Tom Delaney um, for their support uh, of the session. So thank you all and I hope you have a great rest of the week. Take care. Thank you.